I'm going to read a verse out of Colossians chapter 3 and then out of Romans chapter 6. And then I've got other verses to read along the way like we usually do. But uh, I want to preach to you for a few minutes this morning on If Ye Be Risen. We're celebrating the resurrection of Christ. But if we're not, we're not celebrating it as a fact of history. It's got to be a reality in our lives. Yes. Or it doesn't make a bit of difference what Jesus did. If, if ye are not risen with him, you're dead in your sins. Right. And uh, no hope means nothing. Means nothing to you. Means nothing to most people. That's why most people are not really celebrating the resurrection this morning. They're talking about it. They're, you know, it's the theme of church services this morning. Well, not all of them. I hear they're having a lot of services where the theme is the transgender and all of that stuff. How close you are? We? How close you think we are? The hour is late, people. Better believe it. I just, I don't understand. I know God in heaven and I don't, and I know his word. I know what he says. I know how he is toward sin and wickedness. And, and there's a line and we're getting mighty close to it. Mighty close. You better get your house in order soon. Yeah, there's no time to waste. You better be getting ready to meet God. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1, it says here, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. You see that if, that's how it starts, if ye then be risen with Christ. Then there's a way to live. If then, if you're risen with Christ, then you're going to live this way. You're going to seek things above, not things below. Romans chapter 6, verses, uh, let's read uh, verses 8 and 9. Bible says, now if we trust, it, uh, why, uh, let me start over. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. There's that if and then again, see. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. There's no such thing as uh, being a partaker of his death without being a partaker of his resurrection. That's right. yeah, the, the cross is not where it ended. No. That wasn't the end. The resurrection, that was the end of the gospel. Yes. Now, and that's where it has to come with us. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. Yep. All right. Death is because of sin. We understand that from the Word of God. And so death cannot be conquered until sin has been conquered. Does that make sense to y'all? Does that agree with what you know the Bible says? Sin brought death into the world. Death is because of sin. Jesus didn't conquer death and leave sin as it was. Amen. Amen. You see, that's what sets us apart. Me, anyway, I don't know what y'all believe, but I do. I believe that he conquered sin. And I believe if you are risen with him, sin has been conquered in you, in your life. I don't believe you're a servant of sin anymore. If you're risen with Christ, (laughs) you're not... You're not going to be a servant to sin anymore. Sin's been conquered as well as death. You ain't going to conquer death without conquering sin. Sin just brings more death, more death, more death. Here's your scriptures for you. Romans 5, 12. A lot of people miss, they read it, then they misapply it. They misunderstand it. They get a different concept from this verse than what the Bible says when they read it. Mm Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world. Now that's pretty simple, isn't it? And death by sin. And so sin passed upon all men. Is that what it says? Anybody that knows the Bible, tell me if that's what it says. That is not what it says. 
And death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You see what, what first? What comes first? What comes first? Death. Sin. <laughs> Romans 6, verse 22 and 23. Listen to this. Being now made free from sin and become servants to God... That's the thing that's happened in your life. If you be risen with Christ. If you be risen with Christ. You're being made, you've been made free from sin. Become servants to God. You have your fruit unto holiness. And the end everlasting life. Well that's what we're looking for isn't it? Isn't that, that what we're expecting? I mean when we say about resurrection. When we've been resurrected with Christ. Isn't that, and aren't we thinking about eternal life? Living forever? Well, that's what it says right there. The end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Seems to me like a lot of people have a concept of salvation as though it were a free debit card or, a, or some kind of legal arrangement where we can continue to sin, live in sin, but the effects and the consequences are paid for or voided. That's the concept that most people have of salvation. Right. It's the concept that's preached in most churches. Yes. In most Baptist churches, that's the way it's preached. Mm -hmm. This whole matter that I'm preaching about this morning is left completely out. We celebrate the resurrection. They don't celebrate the resurrection. They celebrate Easter. Mm -hmm. And hunt eggs and, ha and bunny rabbits. And that's what it's all about. And they teach their children that. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, that's all pagan, godless stuff. Yes. This is about Jesus raising from the dead. Yes. About death being conquered and sin being conquered. Right. Yes, the, the ruination of the whole creation. The reason men are going to spend eternity in hell. It, the problem solved and, and it's ignored. Yep. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. James chapter 1 verse 15. That is a fact from the word of God. James chapter 1 verse 15. But sin, and sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That is 100% of the time. Yes. Every time. No exceptions. Sin brings forth death. Yes. Jesus came and conquered sin and death. Not just death. Right. He conquered sin. Yes. He lived a sinless life. <clears throat> he was tempted in all points like as we are. Yet... What does the Bible say? Without sin. Right. He lived a sinless life. Well, that was because he was God. He was man. Yes, if you deny the humanity of Christ, the Bible talks about in 1 John, that is the spirit of Antichrist. Yes, yes. To deny that God was made flesh and dwelt among us. That he actually became what we are. Yes. And conquered sin and death. That's the spirit of Antichrist. Right, yes. You try to make him all the paganism and all of the cults and everything, make him into something that he was not. Yep. Was he God? Yeah. But he laid down his power. Yes. And, his, and he conquered sin not as God, but as a man like you and I. Yep. Hebrews chapter 2, read it. I read it to you all the time. Yep. For as much then as the... As the Brother, as the brethren were partakers of the flesh and blood, he himself took part also of the same. Yes. So that he could be a high priest, yes. not touched with the feelings of our infirmities. I mean, he, he knew what it was like to be a man. Mm -hmm. And he conquered sin. And how did he do it? If he didn't do it as God, he did it with the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Yes. When he was tempted, and the devil, what did the devil tempt him with? With the Word of God. Yes. It's like he's talking in Sunday school, Seth. He tried to use the Word of God against the Word of God himself. And Jesus answered him with the Word of God. Yep. Do you realize that you have the Word of God this morning? And do you realize that the Spirit of God is available for you also? And if you are born again, the Spirit of God lives in you. So we can live. Not being a servant to sin. That's right. 
Amen. Amen. If you don't believe that, I don't know what you're even doing in church. I don't know what you, why anybody would claim to be a Christian for if they don't believe that. It, there is no salvation if that is not true. We don't need Jesus if death is all that will save us from our sin. Right, right, right. Jesus is the Savior from sin. Yes. And therefore, the Savior from death. Yes. <coughs> A lot of people are talking about and celebrating the resurrection of Christ today. But, but they continue to live in the bondage of sin. Let me tell you something, that's hypocrisy and that's deception. And if sin has not been conquered in your soul by the atonement of Christ provided through his death, then you are not resurrected with Christ. And I'm going to tell you on the authority of God's word this morning, you have no reason to hope for eternal life. Mm -hmm. That's right. Amen. So you're judging. No, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Right. The facts from the word of God. If you then be risen with Christ. The issue this morning is not whether Christ rose from the dead. It's like we said in Sunday school there, you know, it, it's a fact that they have not been able to erase. Google and AI are erasing everything of history. I gave you an example this morning of trying to, of how it is. You can, there's things you can't find now unless you already know it. But they will they'll lead you down the paths that they want you to know and believe. Right. Everything's being erased. It's just like what I, I brought up a while ago, the little thing about Watergate and 50 years ago. And out of this crowd here, they ain't but a handful even knows what that, has any idea what that was about. History is gone. But the resurrection is not. Yeah. Amen. They can't erase that. No. They can't. Make everybody believe that that did not happen because it is such a true fact that it did happen. The real question this morning is, are you risen with Christ? Yes. That's the issue. And that's really all that matters this morning. All of us here this morning, I'm assuming, I believe, know that Jesus rose from the dead. But we can look at each other and we don't know whether it, if you've risen from the dead. The only way we can know is by how you live your life. Mm -hmm. What kind of spirit you have. <laughs> well, right, let me stick to my notes here. Right, we can't identify with him or claim our part in his resurrection unless we also identify with his holy life and his death on the cross. Now to claim one without the other is to deceive ourselves and that'll cost you your soul. Yes. Amen. God's not a reality to most people. Even those who profess to know Him. I'm an old man now. I've lived long enough to... I, when I preach and say these things, I mean it. Do, do you understand that I mean what I say? And I know that what I'm saying is true. I ain't up here just aping a bunch of stuff that I've heard all my life from other people. I've lived long enough to experience life, to study this Bible and know it and know the truth. And I know human nature and I've seen how things work cycle after cycle after cycle. And so what I'm saying, I'm, I know is a fact. And I am thankful I can stand here with that confidence. That's not pride and that's not self-confidence. That's just foundation in the truth. I'm standing on the Word of God, not on what Mike Miller knows. But I've seen a lot. And let me tell you this. Most people, in practice, God is nothing more than an abstract thought. Not actually where they live and move and have their being, as the Bible talks about. In Him we move and live and move and have our being. That's not where most people live. God is just... A thing. They come to church and get him out and look at him, put him away again and go home. They go out the door and live their own life where they're the ruler and the king of their own universe. <laughs> God has no real authority over their life. They do what they think, what they want. 
They do to please other people, please themselves more first, but it's a big concern of theirs to please certain other people also. Anything but God. The religion is an overlay of their life. It's not the very essence of their life. I'm saying that's the way most people live. I hope there's only I hope there's no more than a few of you like that here this morning. I really do. But they use God like Google, like they use Google or YouTube or something like that just to find answers and to make money or to seek pleasure. It's all God means to them. God's not God Almighty. He's not the one who conquered death. He's not the one that's going to judge them and put them in hell for eternity or bring them home with Him for eternity. He's not that to them. He's just something for them to use to embellish their life for others to see a little bit or to enrich their life or make a way for them to accomplish their goals in life. God's their helper, not their king, not their God. When you realize that that's the human race and that's the way most of them are living, you'd be a little bit uh, fervent about it too. Amen. Amen. not very many people care ain't very many preachers care they won't preach to you like I'm trying to do right now Mm -hmm. they'll tell you stories and illustrations and make you laugh and make you try to make you happy so you'll come back and put more money in the plate because most of them depend on the paycheck Well, I never have done that. So that gives me a little more liberty to preach. Because I don't have to worry about that. God has always taken care of me without that. It's a plan for living that they simply use to accomplish and get what they want out of life. You know, some want happiness and peace. and, And they find it in a measure by practicing some form of religion and or isolating themselves from the world around them. They live like that. And they find a measure of happiness and quietness for a while, but it all, it doesn't last. Let me tell you that right now. You're going to find lasting peace and lasting happiness doing that. Many are also after pleasure and driven by pride, and they use religion as a vehicle to safely or to satisfy their desires and their ego. True. Now, true salvation is about knowing God, and also about God knowing you. What is it? What did the Bible say? What did Jesus say he was going to say to that crowd in that day, that crowd that stands there and says, Lord, Lord, didn't we do many marvelous works in thy name? We cast out devils, we've healed the sick, we've done all this in your name. And he's going to say to them, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, for I never knew you. So it's about us knowing God, and it's about God knowing us. You say, well, God already knows me. (coughs) Not in the sense that we're talking about here. God's not your friend if you're in rebellion against him. God's not your friend if you're trying to portray him to the world as something that he's not. If you're going around to the world saying, I'm a Christian and I serve God and you're living like the world and you got a hateful spirit and all the rest that goes with it and practicing sin, you can bank on this, God's not your friend. And see, that's the gospel message now is God's everybody's friend. He's just longing and waiting and just for you to just give him a thumbs up or just look his way and wink once in a while. Now to satisfy him. That's the message today. No, he's Almighty God. He's going to be your judge. I'm talking to everybody here today. We need to wake up to that fact. We don't hear that enough. All we hear is the love and kindness and wonder of God in his mercy and love. And that's all fine and dandy because that he is love. But you, he can't love if he don't hate. And you better believe there's some things God hates. Yes. He hates a proud look. Mm-hmm. 
I asked somebody the other day, trying to reason with him. I said, what do you think? Now, I said, what do you think is the most, the, the most common manifestation of sin among religious people that you've known in your life? Pride, he said. I said, well, you're exactly right. But it's funny how people can see it in others and can't see it in themselves. Well, knowing God, God knowing us, that speaks of an intimate, personal relationship, not a casual acquaintance. He's not just on church on Sunday. If He's the light of your life, then He's not just light on Sunday. Morning. Whenever. He's the light of every day of your life. You walk with Him. He walks with you. That's what it's speaking of. Being resurrected with Christ. Being risen with Christ. That's what this is referring to. Not a casual acquaintance. Not just a friendly uh, feeling toward God and sympathy toward His cause. People... Count that as salvation now if people just change their attitude and, and stop being hostile toward God and hateful. Well, they must be, they must be saved now. <laughs> no, they're not. No, that does not constitute salvation. No. Just changing your attitude toward God. Got to be a lot more than that. You know what there's got to be? Your death. That's what it's got to be. Yes, the death of you. <laughs> Self. Mr. King, Mr. Crownware of your life, Mr. Boss, the one who calls the shots and does what he wants, gets what he wants, says what he wants, and lords it over everybody else that he wants. That old boy's got to die. Ain't going to be no resurrection. You're not anywhere near risen with Christ when all you are is just, you know, not hostile. How can I say it? You just stop cussing him. And you stop hating these people. And you'll go to church once in a while. No, you're still going to go to hell. If there ain't more to it than that. You can go to church all your life. And maintain your selfish, haughty spirit. And you're going to go to hell. Yes, sir. Just aligning yourself with the people of God and the church. That ain't going to do it. And that's all most people, that's as far as most people go. They change their dress, they change their music, they change their language and start going to church. And they just keep on fighting at home and everywhere else. They can't get along with nobody. Everything's wrong with everybody else all the time. And they, they think they're ready for heaven. Lord have mercy. No! you be risen with Christ. It's going to be different. We used to sing a lot of songs. Saying that. It's different now. Since Jesus saved my soul. I bet. How many of you know that song? How many of you ever heard that song? One, two, three, four. Four, five. <laughs> we can't think of nothing to sing. So. Thank God I am free. 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 From the burden of sin. Yes. No, we don't sing that stuff anymore, do we? Well, having an in a, it's about having an intimate relationship with the true God of the Bible. And not making up your own idea of what God's like or what you would like Him to be like. <coughs> and worshiping that idolatrous image that you set up in your heart and mind. It's about walking with God. Being risen with Christ is about walking with God. God being real in your life. So, y'all understand what I'm trying to say there. All of God's creation is made after the same pattern. The whole creation is designed to show us the true God and the way to find Him. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, For the invisible things, the Bible says, of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. The invisible things of God. You say, well, I can't see God. There He is, everywhere. The invisible things of God are clearly seen from the creation. Being understood by the things which are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse. 
How much can you understand about God just by looking around you? Everything. Yes. The invisible things of God are clearly seen. They're not obscure. You don't have to look hard for them. You don't have to have a microscope. You don't have to have an education. No. You can be blind as a bat and look at God's creation and still you see God everywhere. He's got his handprint on everything. Our physical life is sustained by the death of another life. All our food, for example. Everything you put in your mouth came from the death of some living thing. Vegetarians don't want to eat meat. They're still killing plants. And they're, and they're, and they're like all other hypocrites. Their goal is to see how close they can get it to taste like meat. That's their goal. Isn't it funny how the standards of those who want to turn upside down all of God's ways, like male and female we talked about last Sunday night, which is what we're going to talk about this Sunday night again. Their standard is God's standard. But they don't want to do it God's way. Everything gives its life. We don't take a bite of food in our mouth without something has given its life. We've taken its life. So obviously in this sin-cursed world, death precedes life. See, we don't think it's that way. We think life precedes death. We think we live and then we die. That's the way it is in this upside-down world. This sin-cursed world. But that's not the way it is in God's economy, if you will. God's design. No, death comes first. Death comes before life. That's why the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. The whole creation talks, teaches us this and shows us this. John chapter 12, verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Jesus said, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Simple illustration. A grain of wheat. A seed is a seed. And it's going to do nothing until it's put into the ground and dies. Yep. And if that happens, then what's it going to do? It's going to bring forth much fruit. And he is... He's applying that illustration to those disciples he was talking to. Trying to get them to understand how this whole thing works. How do you live? Well, you've got to die first. And that's because of sin. Death is because of sin. God didn't design this whole thing with death in it first. But sin has turned it upside down and put death first. In verse 25 of that same chapter 12 of John, He that loveth his life shall lose, lose it. it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. So if you love your life, you're going to lose it. What, what does that mean? Lose your life. What's, another, what's one word that says what that's saying? Death. You lose it. If you hate your life in this world, that means you look for those things above, like the scripture in Colossians we read when we started out. If you then be risen with Christ, seek ye those things which are above. Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. Sin has separated man from God, who is the source of life, and so death reigns. No one will ever know God until there's a death of the old life. I don't care who you are here this morning. I don't care what kind of home you've grown up in. Your children, you better realize that nobody is ever going to know God until there is a death of self in their life. Can't just teach them and train them and drill them and give them all the knowledge that is not going to do it. No, that's right. They'll grow up and be reprobates. That's right. 
and end up in eternity away from God, condemned forever with all that knowledge. There has to be a new birth. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. There'll, there can be no resurrected life until there's a death of the old. Now, you know, I'm, I use a dictionary a lot. I think that'd be good for anybody. I don't care how educated you think you are. Uh, we're just not as smart as we think we are. We need help. I go back and I read the dictionary and I don't go to Google. I go to Webster 200 years ago before the language was degenerated to the state it's in now. And our culture was degenerated to the state it's in now. Go to Daniel, uh, uh, the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, and here's, here's what it says about death. Now, I want you to listen real close. Because we're living in a time when people says, say they died, and then they came back to life, and the doctors brought them back, and they saw heaven, and they saw the light, and they saw blah, 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 blah. You hear it often. People say, well, I died three times. No, you didn't. It is appointed unto man once to die. Now, if you believe the Bible, you believe that. If you believe all the superstitious nonsense of the world, then you can believe all the rest of it. I don't believe it. You die, you're dead. And here's what the dictionary says. That state, death is that state of being, animal or vegetable, but more particularly of an animal, in which there is a total and permanent cessation of all the vital functions. That's permanent, you see. That's final. When the organs have not only ceased to act, but have lost the susceptibility of renewed action. Death is when you die and you're dead and that's it. Death means it's permanent. And you don't come back to life. Now, and it's not possible for you to come back to life. Death. That's important. Thus, the cessation of respiration and circulation in an animal may not be death. You hearing this? Y'all hearing this? I'm still reading out of the dictionary. For during hibernation, some animals become entirely torpid. And some animals and vegetables may be subjected to a fixed state by frost. But being capable of revived activity, they are not dead. Webster's 1828 Dictionary. That's how he defined death. So, let me just continue and say what I'm going to say here. Death is not self-denial. The Christian life is not about self-denial. It is the end of self-rule and self-determination completely. That's what we're talking about here. The death that has to happen before you in your life before you can be risen with Christ. There must also be a burial of the old self. And to bury means to cover with earth as a seed sown. That's what the dictionary says. To forget and forgive to hide in oblivion, to bury. All right, self, you, what you are, who you are, who you love the most, die, buried, hidden in oblivion, impossible to raise him back up again. The old man is dead. He's not living in here fighting with a new man. That is a lie. Amen. Amen. You, you got a hard task at your hand trying to take the Bible and prove such as that. You will with me because I know what it says. And I know the whole teaching. I know I'm, I'm trying to explain it to you here this morning. Death is death. And resurrection is resurrection. That old man is not going to be resurrected. We're raised a new man. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Only then can there be a resurrected life. A life where God's a reality and not an abstract idea. 
Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 7. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ or were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. <laughs> that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. I don't know how you get it any plainer than that. There is a resurrected life. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 17, Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, Jesus said, else the bottles break. And the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. You a new bottle? You the old bottle. You put old wine in new bottles? Ain't going to work. New wine in old bottles? No, it ain't going to work. What's going to happen? Jesus said, the bottle's going to burst. Can't take it. God doesn't make remake the old. He makes all things new. Yes. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who, gave, who, gave him, who loved me and gave himself for me. <clears throat> new life. New life. Not the old life. I am not the same life that lived in this body before. New creature in Christ. Mind renewed. Heart changed. Everything. All things were made new for me. And I've said this to you a lot, but God don't make stuff out of stuff. He never does. When he, the things which we see are not, were not made of the things which do appear. God didn't take a ball of mud somewhere and throw it out and said, there's the earth. Where'd he get the mud from? They had no such a thing. God said, let there be. And it was. He created out of nothing. And that's the way God always creates. Out of nothing. And as long as we are something, he's not going to make anything out of us. It's only when we become nothing that God can make something out of us. Yes. Do something with us. Are you, have you ever got to zero? Absolute zero? Being a child of God is not about death. Jesus said to Martha, let me read that. Too. I found it because I wanted to read it. John chapter 11, tomb of Lazarus. Lazarus been dead four days. Hopeless situation. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. See, that's what most people are thinking today. They're thinking of the resurrection of Christ. That's a long time ago. And the resurrection to come, it's a long way in the future. That's the way Martha was thinking that day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this, Martha? Lazarus is fixing to walk out of that tomb. The resurrection is here. Are ye risen with Christ? If ye then be risen with Christ. That's the issue this morning right here. Yep. What about us? What about me? What about you? Are we risen with Christ? Now! If the question is not about someday in the distant future when who knows when the graves are going to open and everybody's and then we'll be resurrected. No! I, my eternal life began when I was born again. And so did yours. I entered into eternal life. The only thing that's going to change is my location. Yeah. 
<laughs> That's how it is, people. If you then be risen with Christ, He is the life. He is the resurrection and the life. Now! Not someday in the future or not something way in the past. Today is what matters. Where are you today? So being a child of God is not about death. It's about a resurrected life. I died daily is not speaking of the death of the old man. That's a, that's an, a misrepresentation of God and the gospel that he, that's caused a lot of people to misunderstand and reject God's redemption. I die daily. Paul didn't... Check the context. He wasn't referring to denying the flesh or anything at all. He's speaking to... He wasn't speaking of the death of the old man. It's about Paul facing death every day of his life at the hands of, the, of God's enemies. If you'll read the verse and read the context, that's exactly what he's referring to. He said, they're after me every day. He said, I get up in the morning thinking, they're probably going to get me today. He lived every day as if it was his last day to live on earth. I die daily. I face death daily. Death is a reality to me daily. Paul wasn't struggling with pornography and fornication like people who sit in churches now are and claiming to be Christians. That's the truth. Oh, they just have such a struggle. What's your struggle? How is it that you can't that sin has such control over you? If you then be risen with Christ. Seek those things which are above. Amen. Amen. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That stuff ain't going to go. I mean, being freed from sin, being made free from sin, came servants to God. What are all these people in the churches glorifying their wickedness about and claiming to be saved? I'm calling their hand on it. Yes, sir. It's wrong. It's not true. Jesus died. And he conquered sin and he conquered death. Amen. And he'll do, and, and if that's true, then you trusting in him, he'll do the same thing in your life. Right. And it's a reality right now, not pie in the sky, by and by. You live like hell here, that's where you're going to spend eternity. I don't care if you're a preacher, if you sit in a pew every Sunday, if you give. Thumbs of money to the church. That's what's going to happen to you. God has changed your life. So, that's, there is a life where you can see and understand things that most other people can't. I know that that's a fact. I see the blindness in other people and I'm, well, like I told somebody the other day. This world is not my home. Never been at home here since I've been saved, but it's getting to the point right now where, man, I'm about done with it. I do not belong here. It's such a burden at the blindness of people and the deception, the depth of the deception. and They're unreachable. John chapter 14, verse 21, Jesus said, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them. Well, you can't keep the commandments. That's what you hear from most Christians, so-called, and most preachers now. Well, you know, it's what I said to a preacher one time. You've heard me say this before, but he was a friend of mine. And, and I, I said, you, do, you love, do you think you know the Lord? And he said, well, yeah, know the Lord. I said, do you keep his commandments? He said, well, no, nobody can keep his commandments. I said, man, John, first John chapter 2. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments. And he just, he just hung his head because he knew the Bible enough to know that was in there, but he didn't connect it with this other. Do you know what it says? He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. So why would you say that? 
Because you heard somebody else say it. Because you heard people stand up and testify about it. I'm just no good. I'm the wickedest person. I'm just so wicked. I've seen deacons get up in front of the church and say, I'm just so wicked. I don't know about y'all, but I'm so wicked. I've heard preachers talk about and say this. If you knew how wicked I was, you wouldn't even listen to me preach this morning. And that's supposed to be glorifying Christ who conquered sin and death. Well, boy, you live in a different world than I do. You got a different concept of life and truth and reality than I do, that's for sure. And you don't get it from this book because it is that kind of junk is not in here. This book makes it very clear. Jesus saves. And when he saves you, he saves you from sin and from death. And you got hope. I mean, <laughs> I am the resurrection and the life. Not tomorrow, not 10 years from now, not when I'm 100 years old. Right now, That's right. He lives in me. Does He live in you? Are you risen with Christ? Does the risen Lord live in you? It's your only hope. If that's not true and you don't know that, then you have no reason to hope. Manifest. He said, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Do you hear what Jesus said right there? Jesus said that. He said, If you got my commandments and you keep them, my Father will love you. And I'll love you. And I will manifest myself to you. I will make myself known, plain, open, clearly visible to the eye or obvious to the understanding, apparent, not obscure or difficult to be seen or understood. So I talk about in Sunday school about people <laughs> questioning, you know, is this really real? Is God really real? Is all this true? You be risen with Christ, you won't have any doubt. I've said this before. I've heard people give their testimony about how they doubted and they doubted and they doubted. And, and I, I, I still say it. I mean, from the moment, I remember the moment that it happened. And, and it wasn't a key word that I said. And it wasn't some deed that I'd done. It was just when my heart yielded. And I said, I'm not fighting no more. I'm yours, Lord, and whatever you want. From that moment, I'm in it. And from that moment to this, 40 some years, I have not doubted. I've been very discouraged so many times, but I've never doubted. I've never went to bed thinking, well, am I going to heaven or am I going to hell? I don't know. None of that. Never, 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 never. So well, you're deceived in your heart. Well, think what you want to think. I just believe him. Amen. I believe him. And I know him. And I know what, he's, what, he's, what it's like to just walk with God and be real. Be real. Be real yourself. Don't be a hypocrite and a fake and a phony. And don't be trying to lie to yourself and deceive yourself about what you've got in your soul. It'll change the way you feel about everybody. That's what I said to the other, that guy the other day. I said, well, if you, I said, there ain't no, you know, if you don't turn from your sin, you're not saved. Now, I don't care what anybody says. You, what you profess, what you know, I don't care. Not according to this Bible. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish, Jesus said. I said, you know what that does to you? When old self dies and you don't, when you stop loving yourself supremely, you know what automatic, all, all of a sudden happens? The love of God is shed abroad in your heart. And you love other people. All of them. You care. Amen. Y'all still listening to me? You care about other people instead of yourself. You be willing, like Christ was, to lay down your life for others instead of holding on to it for yourself.
Say, when are you going to quit? Just right here in just a second. There's a life where God does things for you. For your soul that are real. Personal things that sustain you and nourish your soul. I'm not superstitious. You know that. You people that know me. And not a superstitious bone in my body. I hate all that stuff. Preach again. I mean, it's rotten. It's the devil's substitute for faith. Superstition is. Yes, right. But God does things for you. Yes, he does. God's done things for me that I've never told anybody about. Right. There's no point. Right. It's, it was for me. It wasn't for you. It wasn't for somebody else. He said, I'll manifest myself to you. And he will. He will. He's done it for me. I have no doubt. He's done all he needs to do. If he never spoke to me again the rest of my life, he said enough already. I don't need any more. Personal things that comfort and strengthen our heart. Just little blessings and little whispers from on high. They talked about Ruth, handfuls of purpose. Just because he loves us. And he knows that we're but dust. He walked this same path. And he knows. And so we don't have a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are. So he can have compassion. So he can succor those nourish, help, strengthen. He knows how to do it. He knows when we need it. You might come and say, now, Brother Mike, I'm praying for you. I know you're discouraged. I'm praying for you. Well, that's good, but that don't do for my soul. What Jesus does when he just whispers something in there, I can't even tell you. How does it happen? If you've had it happen, you understand. Otherwise, you don't. You just don't know. I can't explain it. Well, do you hear a voice? Nah, I've never heard audible voices. But boy, the Lord has spoke to me. Stilled my soul. Put strength where there was no strength. Resurrected. Not dead in sin. Trespasses in sin. Not dead anymore. Resurrected. Risen from the dead. There's a life where God really moves. And He really touches you. There's a life where there's no doubt whatsoever about God and you can only laugh and wonder at all the infidels and their foolish reasoning against God. There's a resurrected life where, where there's strength for every trial, comfort in every distress, and provision for every need. That's the resurrected life. It's a wonderful life, let me tell you. Yes. I recommend it to you this morning very highly. God will take care of you. All of you. He will take care of all of your life. He'll meet every need. I'll never leave you nor forsake you, he said. When you make that kind of commitment to him, you'll find him true to his word. Salvation is a covenant, you know. So there's a resurrected life. And then it says this, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. What are we looking at here today? Well, you look at, what are you looking at when you see me? You're seeing a body of flesh. Dust. It's going to go back to the dust. That's all you're seeing. Whatever I'm saying is trying to convey to you what, who's living in here. I'm looking at you, trying to figure out what you're saying from in there. Earthen vessels, unable to hold it, unable to contain it. So let me read this, and I'll stop. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse seven through twelve. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. You see the death and the resurrection there? For we which live are always delivered unto death 
for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. In, the, in another sense, it's a cycle that goes on in our life. Life is full of disappointments and heartbreaks. It's full of loss and grief, isn't it? Each time it's almost like a death. Part of you dies when people walk out of your life. People pass away and they're gone. I mean, life changes. I was looking at pictures this week of Sarah's wedding 22 years ago, 3 years ago, 23 years ago. And I saw all the crowd. And I just I thought, my, my. Look at all those people that we used to know. That we used to see pretty often. <coughs> How things change. People walk out, walk away. Other people walk in. It's a changing thing, life is. There's a death and a resurrection. He saw, that last verse, he talked about that. It's, it's the principle that we deal with in life all the time. Always remember this. Death precedes life. Yes. The end of a thing is better than the beginning. Mm-hmm. Amen. Well, let's stand. Let's, have, let's stand. We're going to have word prayer and we're going to be dismissed here in just a second. Are you risen with Christ this morning? Are ye risen with Christ? Well, I could ask you to raise your hands. Most of you wouldn't or would. Some of you wouldn't just because you're going to have no preacher telling me what to do. That kind of tells a tale right there. If you're risen with Christ, you ought to be saying, you ought to say amen. As soon as I said it, you should say, I am. Hallelujah. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. How are you ever going to believe if you don't hear? And how are you going to ever hear without a preacher? I'm, I'm paraphrasing Romans chapter 3. I've done my best to preach to you this morning and say, well, this should have been a better service than this. People are always disappointed when they come on Resurrection Sunday and I pre- or some other holiday and, and then I, they get this. They're expecting a smooth, easy, happy sermon. Well, this is happy. I've just given you the best news that you'll ever hear in your life. You're never going to hear nothing better than the news that I gave you this morning. You may hear it presented in a better way, but you're not going to hear anything better than what I've told you today. Jesus conquered sin and He conquered death and He did it for you. And if you haven't availed yourself of what Jesus has done for you, you better do it. I suggest you do it. Get somewhere alone with God. You don't have there. You don't have to have a written prayer. You don't have to say a certain words. I mean, <laughs> God have mercy on me, a sinner. That's all the thief on the cross. So, you know, that's all the publican said. Thief on the cross just said, "Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom." Jesus said, "I will." Today, not a thousand years from now when I come back and set up my kingdom on earth. Today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. I am the resurrection and the life. You don't have to wait. Today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Amen. Father, I pray you'd bless the word of God now. Pray to have, bring forth fruit. And whoever might hear this, have folks here this morning, a lot of other people are going to hear this. I pray that it would help somebody, it would rescue somebody from the edge of the darkness. 
Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for conquering sin. Thank you for conquering death. Thank you for being the way, the truth, the life, the door, the bread. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Please manifest yourself, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.